Nice. Huh? Oh, yeah. No, but it feels funny if you... I have that also always. Good evening, everyone. So happy to see you twice in one week. Today we have um, a really amazing event, although Monday was also amazing, sorry, Rob. <laughs> uh, another amazing event with uh, two of our friends, Georgina and Marcelo, uh, in conversation with Ferda. Um, so I will do a quick introduction of Georgina and Marcelo and their office, and then uh, Ferda will take over and lead the evening. So, super excited to have them both here. Argentine-born Marcelo Spina and Georgina Hulrich are renowned architects and distinguished academics. They lead the Los Angeles-based and award-winning architectural practice Patents, which they founded in 2002. Patents is also a WBE certified office, which is kind of important. It's a women business enterprise. Um, Marcelo is also a design faculty at CIRAC, and Georgina Hulwich is also an associate professor at UCLA. But of course, we know them from having them here with us uh, at UPenn, both lecturing and teaching for a few years already. Patton's work reveals a rigorous and progressive approach to projects and buildings across materials, scales, agendas, and geographies, insisting on the cultural and social relevance of architectural form, contemporary aesthetics, and emerging technologies. The work has been exhibited worldwide, most notably at the Venice Biennale in Italy, the Chicago Biennale, the Art Institute of Chicago, the San Francisco MoMA, the Vienna MAC Museum, uh, and their work is also in the permanent collection there. Their recent projects include the 33,000 square feet A4H, or All for Health, Health for All, office building in Glendale, California, which was the recipient of the AIA LA Next Award. This five-story building with an idiosyncratic silhouette has as its mission to plan, evaluate, and provide excellent primary health care and social services to medically underserved residents in Glendale. In 2020, in collaboration with the Karma Group, Patents received the first award in hospitality uh, for the 2020 Rethinking the Futures Award for their project Karma in Bequaya. Karma Bequaya is a 60,000 square foot resort um, and is on the second largest island in the Grenadines. The resort features various sizes of living units, public amenities, and a layout that takes advantage of the dramatic sloping site directly to the coast. In the same year, Patents won the third award in hospitality a category of the 2020 Rethinking the Futures Award for their project uh, Stiff Chili that is located in Bali and is a single loaded corridor with approximately 40 suites. It's a very beautiful project, actually. I'm thinking of going once you're done. Uh, that basically takes up uh, Balinese motifs while being distinctly contemporary in its aesthetics. Most recently, of course, and that's why we're here tonight, uh, Patterns published Mute Icons with Akhtar Spain. Part history, part theory, and part monographic atlas, Mute Icons aims to construct a viable alternative to the icons cliche, an exhausted form of communication, positing one that is decidedly introverted and withdrawn. Patents is here developing a language and a sensibility for discovering simultaneous, contradictory, and even unexpected readings of the architectural form. This evening, Georgina and Marcelo will join Associate Professor of Practice, Feda Kolatan, in a conversation about their new book and recent work. Welcome, everyone. Um, does this work? Okay. Great. Um, 
Thank you so much, Winker, for the introduction. And I just want to very quickly, um, before giving it over to the two of you to give your presentation, say um, I'd like to welcome you as well. Um, it's always great to have dear friends, but not only friends, but um, you know, people with whom we share a kind of history over the past 20, 25 years at least, uh, not to hold us in terms of age, but um, you know, so welcome. And just for the audience, um, the way we thought we would be doing this event um, is we start with a short presentation by the two of you, or maybe only Georgina, I don't know. And then um, I have maybe a couple of questions and provocations. We can get into a discussion. And then um, hopefully we'll have enough time to open it up for a few questions uh, from the audience as well. Um, and with that, please. OK, well, thank you for that. Thank you, Winka, for the introduction. It's really such a pleasure to be back and see you all. Um, you really make us feel um, we are home. It's always, yeah, like we love coming here. So, um, and yeah, thanks everybody for uh, being here tonight. So, um, mute icons and other um, dichotomies of the real in architecture, as we have titled the book, was actually a, a proposal, it was a weekend proposal, like uh, around uh, six years ago, uh, when we decided to apply for a grant foundation uh, grant, and we were very uh, very fortunate to be granted the um, to be awarded the grant, um, and then that's when we got into the I would say the beautiful trouble of having to come up with a strategy to support the argument that we presented in the grant, that was basically based on making a book, as Winka was saying, that was part history, part theory, and part um, atlas, and that it was uh, almost as its core. Um, a book that could interrogate images that are historical, contemporary, and more importantly, uh, speculative. So um, the examination um, uh, of the book was, um, or we concentrated on the increasingly dichotomic state of architectural practice, uh, but also discourse and, um, and contemporary culture at large, and uh, we analyzed uh, images that existed, but also images that we proposed, and the idea was to develop a language and a sensibility for discovering both simultaneous, um, but also contradictory, and even, you know, why not, unexpected readings of um, different images in architecture. So um, just to go straight forward to the book and um, the content, or a little bit of a, a glance on the content and how the book is structured, um, is basically divided into five different sections. Um, concept and uh, history discipline and um, uh, projects and culture. The first section is um, what we would call uh, concept, which basically argues that due to uh, many external and also internal processes, architecture is in, um, is in a deep crisis and therefore in need of cultural identity. Uh, we all know that in the past two decades, um, uh, you know, everything, the world has been shaped by events like 9-11, the continued environmental effects of climate change, the financial collapse followed by yet another um, bubbly, uh, maybe, economy, uh, social political movements, including uh, Black Lives Matter, Brexit, MAGA, uh, the ongoing refugee crisis, the rise of populism worldwide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could keep going on and um, on and on. So uh, with no doubt, everything points to, um, to a challenge of the most creative and projective uh, aspects of our field. There is an often, um, I would say, declared you know, idea of the death of the icon, um, where, um, which also includes the specific declaration from the um, Chinese prime minister some years ago of no more weird buildings. And in a way, these are all naive responses to the impulse for increased um, somewhat social responsibility and the search for common sense and common ground in both in architecture as well as in culture. 
So as a contemporary role of the architectural icon came under um, a, a rather deep scrutiny, uh, its cultural persistence was almost like begging <laughs> for a fundamental question, which is what constitutes a relevant and a socially engaged icon nowadays. So not sure that we are able to answer this, but we certainly, uh, certainly want to position an alternative. So um, not that I'm going to give you necessarily a, a lecture on history at all, but this is really important to contextualize where um, I mean the, the concept of the book and um, where it came from and where it went to. So if we were to move from uh, culture to the discipline in architecture or, it, or architecture as a discipline, I would say that the question of the image could be traced all the way back to Robert Venturi's uh, dichotomy between the duck and the decorated shed. Um, also, uh, arguing for the icon, Charles Shanks advocated um, of the importance to sublimate iconography through abstraction. He suggested um, that this moves away from literal iconography, let's say from um, Venturi's uh, duck, as a calculated ambiguity and as an icon with an um, enigmatic signifier. And according to him, to Charles Shanks, the experience of iconic buildings uh, is as diverse as it is paradoxical and why not even contradictory. Icons are architecture, quote, in the shape of something uncanny, fascinating, horrible, lovely, quote. He even suggested that in order to be loved and, and also defended, the iconic needed to be hated and even uh, feared. At first, mentioning the uproar over the construction of the Eiffel Tower uh, in Paris at the turn of the century, which was completely despised at first, only to be revered um, later. So, in a way, we are not, um, a, we are certainly not arguing for the continuation of that notion of the icon, which has, I mean, already run uh, its course, but we are much more interested in a tradition of abstraction and, um, I shall say, uh, muteness. So an example is seen, for example, in the Black Square by um, Kasimir Malevich, which displaces the religious icon that is traditionally placed uh, or positioned in a corner of a room and replaces it with an abstraction. But we're also interested in the real, in an architecture that is also able to produce a constructed tension between um, legibility and reticence and abstraction and realism and character and context. And maybe within or along similar lines, uh, Rainer Baum insisted that brutalist uh, buildings should produce almost an affecting image that is defined as something which is visually uh, valuable and that affects emotions with pleasure, displeasure, or pointedly an, um, almost a, a, an admixture of the two. So by, in a way, limiting legibility and visual pleasure, the mute icons, um, the mute icon demands closer examination, and its resistance conveys resilience, and its introversion stimulates um, communication. So balance between um, object and building, the mute icon is defined by a dialectic legibility, say, for example, uh, strange silhouettes or strong postures or constructed, um, constructive brutality and apparent autonomy from the surrounding uh, ground, um, ground and context. Uh, it has an attitude that is absolute and unstable, that it can also uh, be um, anticipated it, and strange at the same time, and it can manifest and uh, be withdrawn. So um, by being elusive and fleeting, then the mute icon, um, in a way, entice lasting attention by delivering persisting uh, irritation. So it is uh, Timothy Hyde, the theorist Timothy Hyde, who uh, discusses the notion of irritation, and he argues that, uh, quote, 
The passive manner of irritation or any ugly feeling can only be overcome by a complete transformation of the situation from which that feeling emerges. In the absence of that transfor transformation, irritation persists as a simultaneous pulling together and pushing apart of person and architecture." Quote. On the other hand, uh, Viktor um, Slovoski, in his essay, Art as Technique, uh, he argues that Art exists so that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony, quote. So in other words, to make the stone stony is to actually carve away the inscription that is already imprinted on it, um, and it is to turn signs uh, back into things, form into abstraction, and building into object. So um, throughout the book and uh, in our own uh, work, as um, I mean, in patterns, we claim that in order to make the stone uh, be stony, again, architecture must appear uh, strange and uh, wonderful. So here we are with our strange and um, hopefully wonderful uh, book. So the second section of the book, I mean, the first one concept, the second one um, is history, which, by the way, I have to say wouldn't have been possible without, the, uh, without our collaboration with Constance uh, Bell. And um, this section intends to construct a lineage of mute iconicity in architecture by um, by focusing on buildings and projects that over a very long and vast period of time have transcended um, their type, their form, their aesthetics, and um, in a way have become poster children of architectural irritation, autonomy, and uh, even estrangement. So, all the antecedents in the book uh, are organized uh, chronologically and they are described by means of orthographic representations and they are rendered familiar, uh, but also at the same time they are rendered strange um, and they are, in a way, they appeal to a new life while communicating clearly the, um, the paradoxical nature they have as new icons. So just to give you I mean, just one quick example on, on one of these historic precedents and what is the dynamics of, of the book in the approach of each of the precedents. Um, this is a Quasar al-Farid tomb, um, which I mean, we chose it as, as being completely um, fascinating um, in terms of how it resists a very easy definition. So it's basically a solitary figure uh, in the Arabian desert. Um, it has a form that falls between ground and building, and it has a status um, that falls somewhere between found and authored. It is a composite of uh, many different ontological orders that are merged uh, all together in one single mass. And while the clarity of the image places um, or places it in the realm of being iconic, uh, it has a character that is absolutely deceptive and duplicious and, and withdrawn. So um, ultimately the thumb, um, the thumb presents a dichotomy between nature and architecture, between the found object, which is a gigantic uh, boulder, and the designed facade, which is an ornamented uh, frontispiece. Another example is the Church of St. George, uh, which is both, um, with, it's both unified with, but also autonomous from the ground. It has a very strong relationship with the ground, uh, but it comes from the fact that it's carved out directly uh, out of um, the rock in which sits and has absolutely no discrete uh, tectonic parts. So when you look at it from a pedestrian level, architecture becomes all, like both um, ground and object. Uh, it's also monument, it's also space, it's nature, it's artifice, and why not is everything and um, nothing. Um, Boulet's choice of the sphere, in this case, is a deeply uh, political 
um, kind of, I know, very, uh, yeah, political uh, choice and suggests the potential of new icons to subvert existing um, hierarchies. So um, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna move uh, quicker through this, but basically, um, I mean, these are, uh, these are all precedents that ultimately um, they don't require to attract or to engage, but instead almost like to, to deter or defend and um, be irritant. So um, some of the other presidents that we analyzed, just to name a few, were the Met uh, Breuer at uh, Madison Avenue or the Pilgrimage Church of um, St. Mary. The Death Star, so you can see there was a big range of uh, precedents, not just in terms of um, dates, but also in terms of uh, subject matter. The Bruges uh, Concert Hall, etc., uh, and yeah, many more that um, buy the book and you will find them. Uh, <laughs> So uh, now the next, uh, well, the next uh, section is a discipline section, which actually acts as a conceptual uh, bridge. It classifies and identifies um, notes and concepts that move uh, above and beyond history, and it projects possibilities for contemporary architecture to, I would say, take rather seriously. So it literally exploits the visual dialectics of uh, diptychs and it aims to suggest and, um, and construct relations and exchanges. So to do this, we opposed historical precedents with recent projects by our office uh, patterns. Um, and this way we try to generate almost impossible conversations uh, between them, while also, or at the same time, uh, trying to amplify and uh, augment established uh, genres within our field. So for example, again, the Pilgrim Ridge Church, but in opposition with a project uh, for a museum in Budapest, or the Metropolis of Tomorrow with our um, Olympia Towers, and again, uh, so on and so forth. Finally, the uh, projects uh, section, um, which is, is, uh, is an embedded atlas of our own uh, work uh, within the realm of our professional practice. So basically, we are presenting uh, both uh, built and unbuilt projects, uh, maybe more unbuilt than, than uh, built ones, but um, uh, we organize them by means of representational categories. Um, there are a series of diagrams, isometrics, plan obliques, physical models, photorealistic perspectives, uh, photo montages, etc. And they're all featured um, episodically as, as a series of appendixes uh, to ultimately rely uh, on um, rely on uh, the fact of investigating the, problem the problematic relationship between abstract representation and the real. So the first appendix is hyperobliques. Uh, I guess we would all agree that uh, orthographic projection is one of the most significant uh, attributes of architecture as a discipline that actually uh, portrays uh, architecture as both distorted, um, as a distorted abstraction and material reality. And um, hyperobliques intensify this historical medium and are the ultimate paradoxical means of architectural representation. So all these images engage in the similar levels of abstraction and realism, and they are completely free from the subjective limitations of perspective, and they incorporate the material precision and the aesthetic sensibility of the real. The last one, um, no, it's not the last one, there are a few more, sorry. So the appendix about models uh, suggests that models are material reductions of the real, and as such, they're also liberating and powerful. So this is, in a way, the inherent uh, paradox of the architectural object, that it cannot be reduced only to its material constituency, nor it can be completely 
detach from it um, either. So all these photos are combinations of physical and digital objects where um, there is a transferring um, of material from physical to digital, then back again to, um, to material. And, and in a way, I know it, it promotes this feedback um, loop that I know it's not clear exactly where it starts and where it ends. Um, the photorealistic uh, renderings appendix and um, has actually the capacity to create narratives and to tell um, stories. So as you can see, each of the sections is actually quite independent in its own uh, narrative in regards to um, image and image making. And um, I mean, this is why I have to say this is one of my favorite sections. Um, many of these uh, renderings or these images were inspired by the photography of artists like uh, Gregory Crutzon or um, Todd Hido and Thomas Roth. But they're, they're not just about the description of a particular uh, project, but instead they're the result of uh, many different collaborations with visual artists and visualization companies um, with the intention of conceiving parallel narratives in relationship to the buildings. Um, we were also interested in situating projects within their social, cultural, and uh, political and environmental context. And this is, for example, the case of um, a museum in Budapest. Um, it's uh, it's portrayed as uh, in a late winter night, uh, blizzard, the museum is closed. It is strangely contextual, and the, the, the museum appears almost as a dark ghost. I mean, it's almost, you don't see the museum at once. I mean, it's, it's really about everything else, and the museum just operates within the, the background. It's almost that the mass is hidden in plain sight, and it has a silhouette that outlines a an obscure and withdrawn character. It sits uh, before a, ne a nearly empty boulevard um, and it confronts a consolidated block of Art Nouveau uh, reminiscent and other neoclassical buildings along uh, the Budapest um, city park. Um, another museum, uh, this one in Argentina, um, it is fall, it's twilight, it's cloudy day, the museum is closed. I think we always need the museums to be closed to be able to um, I mean, portray them so, in such a strange way. So as you can see, there is almost a, a decapitated uh, tree in the corner, um, a now known piece of clothing that hangs uh, weirdly from a nearby branch, and the bright and exaggerated emer emergency and exit lights of the museum, they're all on. Um, and they cast, um, I mean, pretty, pretty strange effects, effects against the, the white marble facade of the empty building. So this is imagining architecture after hours, um, a lonely context, uh, already strange, and, um, and all these, like, you know, altering the quietness of this magic uh, moment, almost like forever. Um, in this case, almost like how the image affects um, a, or, or a, talks about environmental effects of climate change. So this is a Glendale project in, in Los Angeles. It's a winter night, it's foggy, it's rainy, and um, there is very low visibility and a torrential rain, which is not very real in Los Angeles, but it's almost like Los Angeles looks like a, a scene from David Fincher's film Seven, where the rain never uh, lets up. And maybe finally, the painterly aspects of the cultural geography of Bali. This is one of the, the uh, projects that uh, Winka mentioned uh, to actually construct a cultural identity. So uh, finally, the appendix on photomontages uh, focus on the paradox uh, between abstraction and um, realism. And it is in the case of obliquo, um, which actually aims to experiment with the limits and possibilities of the image and the way it can be technologically captured via drones and its um, a realism, almost like hap a hyper-enhaced. So, um, 
I look forward to the discussion. So um, thank you very much. Great. Um, beautiful work, beautiful book. Um, thanks for the presentation, Georgina. Um, I, I think <clears throat> I want to start the uh, conversation with a bit of a like sort of uh, genealogical, slightly personal history question. Um, not only because I think maybe it's important for the audience who's not so familiar with the entirety of your um, uh, sort of uh, you know development um, as architects, but also with a rather critical um, sort of transition period uh, through which I think your work can also be mapped and understood, um, reaching back to sort of the late 90s, early 2000s digital project, which was kind of the time where you and a whole number um, of us, both in, in the audience as well as myself, sort of started with our practices. And um, I, I recall, and of course, even back then, um, you guys were sort of leaders um, of your generation in terms of generating ideas that were, um, you know, like trying to come to terms with the new technologies of the digital. And um, back then, um, there are notions of flow, for instance, were, um, you know, very common, particularly in your work. And I, I think it's really interesting to, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, um, to put flow and dynamism and motion and movement, which were all sort of derivatives of animation software that, that we're all kind of trying to understand back then in regard to what it can do for architecture. And um, today's presentation, or not today's, I mean, reaching back, I'd say, probably you can correct me, 2008, 2009 is probably an important mm -hmm. year, um, toward the monolith um, and then toward the icon, the mute icon, right? So from flow to monoliths, I think um, is not just uh, an important um, development in your own work, but also something that reflects um, at least uh, you know, in, in one corner of the architectural avant-garde, how, how um, a transition has been taken place culturally. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you can say a couple couple words. I also wanted to add, for those of you um, who don't know, there was a really um, interesting, important exhibition that um, Marcel and Georgina curated uh, called Madness of Sensation. Uh, I believe it was in 2008 mm -hmm. at the Artist Space mm -hmm. in New York. Um, which is often, at least among some of us, cited as, as the moment where one type of project came either to a halt or had to reinvent itself in some way. So I wonder if, if that's also a critical date for you. But um, really, just um, what is for you the significance of the move from uh, ideologies of movement, change, flux, and flow toward those of iconicity and monumentality? Well, maybe the, um, I mean, the, it's a great question, or many, I, I have to um, map maybe what to answer first, but um, I think it's important to, um, to know that we were educated at a time, I mean, both at UCLA and Columbia University, where um, I mean, education was at the uh, at the digital term, uh, at a digital turn. And however, we, I mean, uh, even though we have been in a way placed within that generation, um, we we never really um, we've always felt a little bit uncomfortable with the, the nomenclature of I know, like digital or, or I know, paperless architecture or the, um, and of course, I mean, we were very uh, happy to be included in, I know, in shows and books and, and um, et cetera. But I think it's a, um, I mean, we, we always wanted our work to be received for what it was. And there's, there's always been a, a sense of uh, feasibility or plausibility in the work that, um, uh, that in a way, I know, maybe, maybe critics and, and writers and curators like see it in a different way. Uh, but, 
But again, I mean, we were happy to be included yeah. in all that. But I think you know, from the very beginning, like some of these ideas always kind of like moved towards you know, like a more material um, realm. I mean, I think that the, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, the matters of sensation show what's an important, an important point, as, as you said. Uh, it's interesting sort of to look back because I, I, at a time, um, you know, there, there was a whole thing, and maybe a lot was made about like the kind of sensationalism of it, you know, which was not the intention. Uh, our intention at the time was really to kind of put sort of architecture, like lay, lay architecture kind of bare through these objects, let's say, objects, small pieces, models, prototypes, things like that, you know, to not have any kind of process to remove any sort of notion of the digital, to remove any idea of digital fabrication, digital craft, all of those sort of like themes that had kind of come to be associated with the work. And, and in our mind, it was never really, in that sense, it wasn't the essence of the work. It was just like, you know, the kind of the, the, the gimmicky of it, you know, of it. And, 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 you know, we had conversations of this. And so the, the intention of that show was, was really to kind of put forward these objects. I don't think we were discussing you know, in, uh, those, uh, that show in, in, in that way. Uh, but certainly the, the appeal of it, the beauty of it, you know, in, in terms of this kind of ecology of objects was, was really around this idea of almost these sort of autonomous things that, that entering into a kind of conversation to each other could produce something larger to that. Uh, to, to your earlier questions about the shift from flow to, to kind of like maybe rocks or monoliths, um, I, I think there is a kind of earlier shift that, that we began to realize probably around that time, you know, around the time of our, our first book, which was around 2010, um, that really kind of includes work of kind of these sort of two trajectories. Uh, we, we started to realize that, that, you know, that, you know, the sort of materialism or, you know, ideas that were philosophical in nature that were kind of being brought back to the, to the discipline will not account for things such as like, you know, the uh, shapes of lots or, or, or the mass of buildings or, 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 or volumes or, or things that have been kind of more germane to the, to the history of architecture and, and started to kind of see the limits of that. Uh, and so therefore, I mean, and this is obviously seen in other, in other practices as well, I guess, um, we, we began to see the kind of maybe the limits of, of, uh, of the flow. And so in our own work, especially when the work begins to get built, I think there is a, that, that transition uh, begins to be articulated and exists. So there was never, even though we had projects and we were interested, and I think, you know, the attention to hyper, you know, hyperbolic surfaces within volumes was, was one way of like somehow dealing with that. Uh, how do you go from there to kind of monoliths or, 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 or you know, more sort of like, I think, I think there's just an understanding that, uh, and then again, maybe kind of a little digression is that we always, we never saw our kind of thinking, uh, intellect, you know, cultural, intellectual as a sort of subservient to the practice, uh, nor the other way around either, but we always saw somehow those two things kind of in relationship. It means that we, we didn't want to theorize what we could not, you know, we could not uh, mm -hmm. realize and, and vice versa, so try to adjust those things. And, and then we wanted to really kind of push forward and realize that architecture can naturally and, and uh, really kind of behaves in terms of volume, mass, silhouette, you know, outlines, and obviously all those things, you know, and uh, other aspects that maybe are in relation to flow, in relation to the ground, in relation to movement, that could still com continue to enhance some of that. And I think some of the, the work that Georgina was showing in Budapest are sort of hinting to that transition. Some of those are actually still sort of solid conceptually, uh, and yet they're maybe somewhat uh, are sort of hinting to aspects of flow, you know, and it's but, not, yeah. Yeah, but also in the, I mean, if, if uh, placing flow within, I know, the, the, the background of the work of the late 90s, and uh, uh, I think there have been just very few projects where, I mean, like flow was just uh, determined by a surface, in a way, flow also, I mean, was mainly related to the articulation of mass. So in a way, mass and volume 
that then you know, translated into the rock <laughs> were always, I mean, somewhat embedded within you know, the work from the very beginning. So um, ultimately, and as Marcelo was saying, after uh, we presented our first monograph in 2011, um, I would say that then you know, this book, in a way, you know, it's both a fracture from projects that were you know, nice and happy and beautiful to, I mean, a series of projects where we are, I mean, in a way we feel that, you know, why do we have to be so nice? Why everything has to be so fluid? Why everything has to be, you know, clearly legible? So, um, so in a way, I mean, I think that that's a, um, I know, we want it to be very clear about the point that we are architects and ultimately, I know, the work that we produce like, there is no way that we can, as Marcel was saying, like, theorize on things that we don't feel that they also they're working within the, I don't know. The That's it. I mean, the, to me, there's, uh, there's a part that seems almost diametrically opposed, obviously, flow monolith, but there are other elements that I do see some kind of continuity in the work. For instance, when it comes to an emphasis on questions of legibility. And um, you, you just said fluidity is, is clear to you, but I, I could also argue that the notion of fluidity was that you cannot capture it, right? There's a constant yeah. sort of shimmering, glittering that does not allow you to hone in on it. And it seems some of that is um, present in these newer monolithic geometries as well. It just um, it's manifested in different ways by the way how you angle it, by you cut it. I mean, there are certainly moments that make it difficult to read the shape as is. And it seems that is still something that continues in the work. And that's obviously, I assume, part of, of the notion of muteness. Uh, the other would be affect and interest in, mm -hmm. and your interest in affect, I mm -hmm. think, yeah. is still kind of unbroken, which is very yeah. clear also when you talk about photographers like. Todd Hero and Crutzen and um, Strud or yeah, right. Right, right, whatever. Yeah, right. um, so, so that to me is, is interesting as well as a, as a continuity, an odd continuity, if you will. Um, let me jump to the next question. I like my little categories here. I'm, <laughs> of course, in the context, the political social context of the last two years, and you, you put up um, a couple images regarding that, um, to talk about icons, um, things that have certain meanings, that objects are imbued with meaning, that is some kind of a social cultural agreement um, that we, uh, yeah, collectively associate with something. Mm -hmm. And then it's good or bad, or it's first good and then bad, and maybe it's first bad and then good, etc. are obviously questions that have come under under the magnifying yeah. glass through yeah. things like Black Lives Matter and the protests and bringing down um, monuments mm -hmm. and statues, etc. So it's obviously an incredibly charged notion to talk about icons. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm actually teaching a studio called Iconoclash right now, so my <laughs> students are very interested in your take of icons too. Um, so I, I, I was wondering if you, if you touched a little bit on it, but I mean, um, is there a more sort of direct way for you to articulate when you use the word, what is a contemporary, you have that question in your book, what is a contemporary icon, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we can, we have somewhat of an idea, mm -hmm. but is, is, could you give a sort of more specific, maybe not even an answer, but some kind of a description? Um, what makes these projects contemporary icons in your uh, I mean, I think... Um, we need to do the whole book to try yeah. to figure out. We are still trying. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think, I think there is a... Um, I think images have meaning, clearly. Uh, if they don't have meaning, you know, they are assigned meaning. Uh, in fact, you know, the, 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 our use of the word icon is... It's, it's a little bit kind of misplaced because I, you know, we don't, architects don't make icons, you know, like 
only culture, make icons, you know, after they absorb buildings, they absorb projects in particular ways. Uh, and so in that sense, it becomes interesting how much of an architect can really project uh, 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 iconicity onto, onto things that are like, you know, ultimately it's just like material, let's say, form. And, um, I mean, we're certainly in support of like things that have like been associated with like violence or things like that, that if those things need to be taken down, you know, so be it. I don't, I don't think, you know, I, the, the, the question that we're arguing is more like a sort of general, which is like, when images are taken down, they're usually replaced by other images that they have, you know, their own iconography. And the question is, what, what is that kind of iconography? And obviously, iconography comes from, from, from many levels. Uh, our, our argument is that, you know, that, that there is a, there's still a need for iconography. You know, like Jenks, you say, like, you know, people still want to kind of leave their houses and go to places and they will do so partially because these are landmarks, they have like some kind of meaning, they have some, uh, you know, some level of interest to them, otherwise they, they wouldn't do it. Uh, I mean, especially in the public realm. Uh, and so we argue for a certain tension that somehow it wouldn't be a, a complete silence, uh, it wouldn't be that the absence of any meaning, the absence of any, Im if, of any image, but, but th this idea of attention, this idea of like, uh, uh, of, of pushing together and pulling apart uh, of personal architecture, this idea of an irritant, I think, is an interesting case, and it's 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 kind of a paradox that that, that our version of new icons try to sort of position in a way. How exactly is done? I think it really kind of you know it is project by project. It's not a formula for sure. I mean, it's more of an idea, and, and this is one of the issues of this book, which is not it's, it's both kind of a sort of monographic atlas, but it's also kind of an idea book to say well. Here's what we think, you know, architecture can do with some of these issues, you know, instead of architecture becoming a, a kind of crowd pleaser to issues of, you know, of uh, the need for common sense and common ground and all those things, you know, that, that are definitely important. Uh, but architecture doesn't have to just like, you know, architecture can do good without necessarily looking good, you know, without looking just friendly all the time, you know, and in that sense, I, I think there is an opportunity, uh, obviously more on the sort of public realm than on, you know, I don't know, developers' project, let's say, um, which is a bit more subversive, to, to do just that, you know. I mean, it's, it's a complicated subject, obviously, because it involves politics and involves meaning, uh, but I, 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 we deeply believe that there is, a, there is a possibility out of that, and it's not necessarily also by architecture just making friends, you know, and being the kind of a, um, the, the sort of do good of the of, of the kind of social realm only, you know. Let's say, I mean, of course, architecture has to do good. Architecture has to engage. Buildings have to be open, you know. So, if you look at our monoliths, they don't hit the ground with like solidity as the older, you know, monoliths will do. They are mostly kind of open and permeable. So it means like, you know, we're kind of attentive to some of the mistakes of some of, of the past, you know. And we wouldn't do a, you know, we wouldn't do a lonely castle in the middle of a city, you know, as beautiful as we think that structure is, you know, in the Arabian desert. So. Um, I mean, it's a complex subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, the only thing yeah. I would add yeah. is that um, mm -hmm. um, I, I th it was very surprising, like in the making of the book, like uh, how we would start to um, learn and experience of these completely I know, kind of like opposite or impossible discussions between a president and our work. Like in a way, the notion of iconicity was mainly being defined when these two elements were acting in, in opposition rather than for the absolute value that each of them have. So in a way, the argument of what constituted the, or, or the iconic aspect of that uh, conversation was I know, just evolving on a project by uh, project basis. And I don't think we, we would have been able to do it without having the framework of the book. Yeah. I mean, this leads me directly into my next question because, I mean, it appears to me you have the word dichotomy in your subtitle of the book, right? Other dichotomies of the real. Um, so it, it's clear that the, the dichotomy that we are really talking about is, is that between the real object of architecture and the representational object of architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, that, of course, is... A, you know, as old as architecture itself, right? I mean, the first carvings or monuments already deal with these issues in their own way. Um, and it will probably always be part of architecture. It's interesting to revisit it 
once in a while and bring it back to the fore and ask, um, I guess, new kinds of questions in what those tensions are. Um, I think that's where, you know, the, the word real or realism, you very, I think, deliberately hint toward, again, a kind of larger cultural movement toward philosophies of realism that in the last 20, 25 years have become, again, you know, sort of more prevalent, um, you know, speculative realism, but also new materialism, object oriented ontology, and so forth, a kind of, you know, response to, I would say, the state of the world, uh, the Anthropocene, you know, the kind of global warming, all those kinds of things where, you know, there's a cultural awakening that we should focus at the objects at hand, mm -hmm. not at the things that um, are dependent to our minds, but mind independent, right? I mean, there's that whole narrative going on. And so in that relationship, I'm, I'm also interested in um, the dichotomy because at, at the end of the day, um, the object will always, the architectural object will always have a representational value of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it will be different according to whoever looks at it, right? Mm -hmm. The constituency will also define the representational meaning of a particular object. Its time will define it, etc. But when you make that such a central element of your book project, and therefore by definition your project as well, um, do you believe that there needs to be some kind of orchestration of that relationship? Do you think there's a way through design to, um, you know, shed some light on those kinds of frictions in relationship to the contemporary problem of representation and the real object? I'd be interested to maybe hear a couple mm -hmm. more lines to that. I think the, I, I agree with everything you said, but the, the only the notion that the the main dichotomy of the of the of the book is between the is between the, the real and and the sort of mechanism of abstraction. I think that uh, obviously we use heavily the idea of like you know of uh, of obliques. Or, I mean, even though there are perspectives, obviously, um, to sort of depict these things, you know, to depict like you know to depict the the pieces kind of in autonomy, the object, the architecture buildings in autonomy to, to center on the space of the objects, you know, rather than the objects on space, you know, uh, which is the kind of big sort of breakdown between, you know, kind of parallel projection and, 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 and perspective. But as you clearly said, that's, that's obviously a kind of representational issue, let's say, you know, when the objects exist in the world, that's, that's probably going to be a kind of a, a it won't matter. And so what I'm saying, I think the dichotomy is between things that are uh, possibly kind of uh, visually present on, on the things, let's say, you know, if one conceives of the real as like, you know, that which is kind of available to everyone, no? And so, uh, and so, you know, the idea of like have character and have muteness at the same time, you know, like cancel somehow partially a character of building, you know, or, or, um, or something that it would be sort of, mon you know, monolithic, or monolithic uh, but it also would be sort of engaging, you know, something that would, you know, buildings can be monolithic because they cannot be solid, not they can be impenetrable. So monolithicity in architecture is a paradox that is built by architects to maybe delay apprehension and delay understanding of either issues of scales, part to whole, how big is the building, how many levels it has. All of the things that, that in our mind kind of entice curiosity, attention, and, 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 and produce a certain, you know, a, a certain interest, let's say. And, and so, so this would be the only thing which, I mean, obviously the issue of representation is important because it becomes a way of like, you know, discussing that, uh, but it's not, it's not meant to say that the, that the dichotomy itself is between the kind of real and, mm -hmm. and the version of it, architecture as a kind of representation, um, if I understand correctly. The, the, yeah, but uh, to, to me, abstraction would yeah. be a representation. Right, right. right. I mean, so yeah. when you talk about abstraction as a way of erasing signification on the object, that would right. be a representational act versus the object also being the withdrawn object, which is the word you use, which would be the real object, right? Yeah. At least if, if withdrawn right. is sort of yeah. alluding yeah. Yeah. to, you know, Graham's concept. Exactly. Yes. And it's yes. legibility. Yeah. Regardless, yeah, right. I mean, if it's directly related to representation or not. Yeah. 
No, I mean, um, again, to me, it's actually super interesting, mm -hmm. um, that particular tension. And it's clearly not, uh, we cannot give an answer to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we can sort yeah. of try to evoke notions through the way how we design. Yeah. But I think, right. um, I, find, I find also really quite courageous <laughs> to take on these kinds of questions. They, they come yeah. certainly with all kinds of perilous um, you know, conditions. Um, so I think you know, just, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I want to ask one more question, and then I want to open it up yeah. to, um, to the audience. And that question is, um, has to do with Los Angeles. And it has to do with context, because in 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 one way your your argument has a lot to do with decontextualization, mm -hmm. right? Um, the the monolith in and of itself is something that stands alone. Often, it stands in contrast to its immediate environment. Um, muteness is something that appears to break relationships, right? To a certain degree at least. It doesn't speak. It just is mute. Mm. <laughs> so a lot of what you are presenting to us is sort of emphasizing on decontextualization um, in order to, I would assume, to find new relations, new legibilities, mm -hmm. etc. But then there is LA. And I think LA is very strongly in your projects, in the way how you render them. There is something, um, I mean, you even mentioned Fincher. I was also thinking about the latest Blade Runner, yeah. uh, where it also rains all the time and it's set in LA. Um, so somehow LA is obsessed in science fiction with rain. Um, maybe not so surprisingly. Because we science fiction. Right. Yes. But I'd just be interested. You've been obviously yeah. uh, living there for a very long time. Um, is the monolith, in all of its decontextualized nature, maybe the contextual object for a place like LA in regard to its own urbanism or the lack thereof? I mean, um, I, I think your question of LA is really timely. And I think everyone, well, at least we have a kind of a sort of, like with everything else, I guess, a sort of love-hate relationship with, with things. And, and, and Los Angeles is not, maybe it's not exception. I mean, obviously we have been there and, 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 and it's a great city for, for a number of things. Uh, but there's this kind of inherent tension, you know, even in the way you perceive the city and histories of the city, this idea that, you know, people like to, Complain about one thing, but also complain about the opposite as well. You know, like like uh, you know that the, the city is too homogeneous, but it's also too eclectic, and so on. And I think these kind of ideas, those tensions, uh, register in us. You know, as a kind of maybe as, a, as our work in, in a bit of a reactionary way uh, to you know the perceived culture of the new or the excess of the new in, in, in Los Angeles, which is so kind of you know pervasive. Uh, the culture of the radical, of you know, the, the sort of previous generations, and so on, and and so I, I think we try to kind of, you know, in, in, if anything, we try to through our work build some kind of cultural identity, uh, and and it's interesting because the question of context that you you mentioned, some of our many of the latest work we have in Los Angeles are actually what one would consider, you know as a kind of like basic adaptive reuse, let's say. You know, they are existing a bowstring trust turned into a medical offices or a, an existing kind of bastard uh, mid-century turned into a kind of nicer, you know, uh, contemporary house or, you know, or a kind of shady corner building turned into a kind of a nice public urban theater uh, on the Sunset Strip. So in, in all of those things, there's a, there's a point that we try to make to sort of turn things around, you know, without like completely destroying what exists, but trying to somehow give sort of new found meaning to these often banal structures, let's say. And, and, and in that, you know, let's say obviously, you know, bringing new things, new attribute properties and, and features, but still kind of maintaining that tension with, with what it was. I think it's something valuable. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a super interesting question because we haven't really thought about yeah, it. Yeah, we really, yeah, we, we never thought about it. And I think the, um, I mean, I wouldn't say that this is an LA book, 
because I mean we are Argentinians and and you know, as much as our practice has been you know, mainly uh, based in Los Angeles, um, we really I mean we don't consider ourselves to you know kind of operate locally, but you know, all the opposite. But um, I think there is a, um, a there is a fact of like wanting to constantly, as Marcelo was saying, revisit what we've seen before because that, that, that's an intrinsic quality of Los Angeles. So in a way, if we were elsewhere, maybe that critical attitude wouldn't be as present as it is while living in Los Angeles. So maybe, I know, the attitude towards um, uh, or maybe the, the thinking of the narrative of how to look at the work, let's say within the framework of this book or a similar one, might have been different. So the, we cannot avoid that our practice is based there in LA. And so, I mean, in a way it is consistent to being there, but it's also a reaction to you know, the way that, that things um, operate in Los Angeles. Because iconicity is also expressive there is, I mean, it's either flat and emotionless, or it is, I know, you have the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, exactly. Great. Um, yeah, maybe uh, are there, I'm sure there are, excellent. Um, do we have a mic? Like, uh, right front, second row over here, please. Thank you so much for, for your wonderful presentation. Um, so rich and so loaded with meaning, to be sure. Um, it seems that uh, in architecture historically, um, in a vast majority of cases, the notion of iconicity has presupposed the notion of lobotomy, right? So that is a more or less explicit disengagement between the domain of, should we say, the building, building as representation so everything to do with fig the figural condition, shape, mass, and how all of those qualities amount to um, imageability, right? Quality of Im imageability of the building on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the domain of um, the building as special organization, right? So everything that happens um, on the inside, special articulation, right? So I was wondering whether you guys have given any thought to and this, should we say, dichotomy, another dichotomy to add to, uh, to the one that, that you were talking about earlier, about how to perhaps transcend it, or how to establish some kind of relationship between these two domains, whether it's one of continuity, or one of tension, or one of rejection, or further that disengagement. Have you guys given any thought to that? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, just to be clear, I think that the, the, so the, the question is the relationship between iconicity, let's say the image, you know, exterior appearance of architecture and maybe a special organization, internal organization. I mean, a, a question was asked and, and, you know, at this point, you know, you become aware of like the, the shortcomings of your, of your work, you know, and the shortcomings of the book that is all about images, let's say, and, and purposely and consciously so. And there's not a single interior, not a single plan on it, you know, the only diagrams and, and so. Uh, so it's focused on that. It's it's aimed to be exhaustive of a, of a certain problem, but not to say that architecture shouldn't care about interior, shouldn't care about drawings, and so on. In fact, we, we do a lot of that, you know, in our own work. Um, I, I think how those two things come together, it, it is kind of it is paradoxical and, and problematic in a way. And 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 so we sort of took the book as a bit of a test to say how can we sort of do this so far. Yeah, not only just on the renditions that we did, you know, uh, over years, but also in the descriptions, and we realized that often some of the, our own description of the project needed more information that we were really putting forward, you know, and it was in, impossible not to kind of, you know, consider, I mean, like, we know the projects, we know their plans, we understand sections and so on. So, um, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's somewhat together with, you know, but the book, it, it tends to be a little bit myopic in that sense, you know, to really 
concentrate on something and see how, how much you can sort of tease out from there. Uh, but the, you know, like the lobotomy, I mean, clearly if you were out, if you were out there as an architect just to kind of do shape and, 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 and character and, and all of those things, there would be much easier and much less laborious ways of doing it than, than the way we are doing it. So I think, uh, you know, if you, if you kind of read a little bit uh, uh, the work and the way we, we write about it, it's certainly not aiming to a kind of, uh, um, you know, um, happy kind of uh, quickly sort of make up, you know, it's not, a, it's not a decorated shared approach, you know, to, to architecture, so it's not a kind of sort of new neo-pomo idea of how to, I mean, of, of how to create those images, you know, so in fact we're sort of looking deeply to those images very much as kind of in, in relationship with, with, with what one would consider form, you know, like I mean, form, mass, volume in a way, I mean, those things are not the same, but they're clearly in, in relationship with each other and therefore are completely related to, you know, internal organization of projects and so on. I don't know if I answered your question, you know, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, um, I mean, not to say that any of that should have been included in the book, no, I was wondering almost more, you know, on a conceptual level, right? I mean, you guys have shown the Venturia model, I mean, that um, lobotomy is embedded there already, right? I mean, we get information about the building as a site, but not about the, about the interior, and usually oftentimes when you bring up this question, um, you're going to get a certain rejection, perhaps of iconicity, but not so much the idea that actually you can perhaps imagine new interiors or new models of special organization precisely through iconicity, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to say, no, iconicity is wrong, let's go and you know, let's worry about this and worry about that. So I was wondering about just But it's, it's actually a really important point that you are bringing up with the interiors because, I mean, that would be maybe another volume <laughs> of the book in the sense that, I mean, like right now we prefer thinking that all the precedents that we are presenting in the book, they're solid masses. Right, I mean, if from the moment that we start to consider them, like being hollowed and, and, and uh, being just the containers of interior, I think they, I know, not that the conversation would be different, but it would have to address many points that we are not necessarily focusing on right now. Okay. Other questions? Rob? Really simple question. Um, fantastic work, of course, and fantastic book. Um, very simple question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of articulation or pattern as patterns um, in its role in, in either kind of defining or um, like how does it speak towards the icon or the monolith? I don't know, maybe a kind of practical, very straightforward answer would be that, um, or maybe I know one of the readings is that it has to do with legibility and the idea of, I know, like the object almost like promoting different narratives depending on I know, the range of um, kind of I know, vision and like the description that it presents depending on what you see, or if you're seeing the silhouette, or if you, I know, like that's from it, I know, kind of like from a far range, but then you get very close, and then the idea of that articulation might start to bring up like a completely different set of relationships between, let's say, I know, surface and mass, or, I know, volume. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... You, you were asking of the, the, the kind of, more at the level of like surfaces. Yeah, right. surface right. articulation. Right, right, right. I mean, texture, yeah, exactly, yeah, relief. Yeah. Part, part of the reason I mention it is um, you were also, Marcelo commented before about how monoliths kind of hide, well, hides um, yeah. kind of architectural things like, you know, floor levels, um, mm -hmm. you know, these types of things. And it, it seems that a lot of the, the kind of textural or graphical work in a lot of your projects is very much in unison with the object and seems to enable it to speak be, um, in a way that it's no longer a victim of mullions or, or these kind of architectural scale things that might undermine the integrity mm -hmm. of the object itself. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, 
I mean, this is always an ongoing thing, and this is maybe one of the things that are like it becomes a bit like subjective because we realize that sometimes you know we have certain kind of reactions to you know articulate certain things, you know, uh, but it's never the kind of full thing, you know. It's never or uh, it's usually it's a, a, a matter of even like giving volume differences, let's say, to given like corner conditions, you know, the project in Glendale has sort of literally a, a, a sort of a kind of corner problem as a three-dimensional corner, and we keep sort of drawing the chassis views, not because we like chassis, which we do, but also because we actually are showing a, a facade which is entirely flat, and it's just courting wall, you know, with like bad joints and so on, and which is supposed to almost disappear into kind of sky reflections. The other one, it's a series of vertical things which are kind of nosy, fuzzy, let's say, and will have depth. And then the bottom one is a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of stamped metal soffit. And, 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 you know, we have details of how we want that thing because obviously to try and make all that, you know, kind of disappear into a sort of knife edge, it's not an easy thing and we don't know if we were able to do it. And, you know, and so it's like, Technically, the volume was just a prism that was cut, you know, in a corner. So nothing indicated in the volume that it needed to be three-faced, let's say. And so, I don't know, maybe this is like, uh, it's a good question, you know. I, I, I think we just, uh, we think of it in terms of like architecture means like, and a sculpture probably wouldn't think of it that way because you will see the object probably at close range, you know, you wouldn't mm -hmm. see it two blocks away. Architecture has that sort of far away and close up, which for me should add something, you know, to the, you know, for. To, to the material, to the articulation, and we try, if possible, to, to deal with those things, you know, with different materials or different techniques. Yeah, and, and it ultimately more or less challenges the, the legibility of the object, because then, I mean, and I think that's when maybe we talk about the, um, that it doesn't have to be necessarily geometrically complex, because there is already also the intention of using the way that the mass is articulated in order to also confuse that geometry. I mean, maybe an you know, cube, you might not never see or perceive the cubeness of the cube just because of the, the altering and the, the, you know, the way that these surfaces are articulated. Congratulations, an awesome presentation and book. Um, I think you achieved the, the very uh, challenging thing to add something to your project with the book itself. Um, I think it's, I, I get the sense this could be an icon in and of itself, not a mute one, but a very thoughtful one, very bold and daring, and at the same time, well prepared and thoughtful. Um, there's a um, particular part of this chapter, sec the second chapter, I think, that Georgina was presenting where you are, um, and this goes back to Ferro's question of representation, maybe. We are showing um, these wonderful projects, but you are illustrating them not with the same visuals that we know. And I was wondering if you did um, create these representations yourself, or were these renderings that you made upon a remodeled version of the project? I think the, the boldness lies in adopting those projects in order to position your own. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's a, it's a wonderful question. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be super honest with, with this. You know, when we, we, you know, Georgina mentioned, you know, we had this like weekend idea for a book Hey, Graham is due yeah. Monday, we send it out, whatever, we put it out there. And then we like somehow like wanted to try and make it work. Let's say, how do you do a book that is a monograph, but it's not a monograph, and it connects to the things that we've been discussing and so on. So, so then you start researching, we're going to use all this project and so on, but then it's like, we don't want to have, we're architects, we're not historians, you know? We're like, I mean, with all due respect, means like, I never had to kind of request images, you know, and sources or, you know, or ask MoMA for like, give me all these images. And so we figured like, we're just gonna make these things, you know, we're just gonna model them and render them. And then, I mean, 
you know, certain projects are easy, but how do you render projects such as, like, you know, Ledux, you know, where, like, only drawings exist, you know, like, I mean, you render them as drawing version of the rendering, which we try, you render them as what the intended architect wanted to do, we you know, Ledux, you know, um, Boulev, sorry, had this, like, amazing illustration where it will show the building in mostly shadow, and then uh, show like super close up of those stones, you know. And so from far away, it looks like a solid rock. Mm -hmm. Close up, you could see there were panels. And, you know, same happens with Nouvelle's uh, unbuilt opera house in, in Tokyo, where like you had this kind of thing. So we, we tried to somehow stay a little bit true to, to that idea in a way. But, but obviously, at that point, is where like, you know, and we haven't had any architect that's complained. I mean, clearly, we're not expect <laughs> Boulet send an email to us. But, but like, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, okay, we're going to rewrite history in some form, you know, yeah. take some licenses where probably some people will not be happy with it, you know, because these things are out of the context. They are only, let's say, their realism, it includes only, it's a very selective realism, let's say, you know. Uh, I mean, like, our Casa de Musica has probably a few other things that are not rendered there. And to show so that's when we might get the email yeah. from Orme. I'm sure but, they have other things, you know. But. Yeah, but I think it's I also, I mean, it also has to do with um, uh, maybe the, in terms of how you make a book and what I was saying before in terms of, um, I mean, the constant surprises and the evolution of ideas that maybe started in a way, but then just the, the actual, I know, like, technicalities of how we were arriving to certain things. I mean, in this case, made us almost uh, have the absolute need to author all these precedent, precedents. I mean, in a way that we need to own them in order to be able to have these conversations with other projects. I mean, we couldn't, it, it wasn't just about, even though that's maybe one of the ideas from the beginning, that, that we just needed the source material, we need the data, and then, well, let's see what we do with that. We need to really own everything in order to, to establish those uh, narratives. So um, five years of modeling and drawing and trying, and yeah. OK, it's almost eight. Um, I'd really like to thank the two of you for this um, really thought-provoking book and presentation and coming out here. Thank you for that. I thank the audience, of course. The books are in the back. I really recommend all of you to at least have a look at them um, at your time. And then there is a reception, I believe, in the tents. Is that, yes. is that the case? Yes. Wow. Wonderful. Oh, so you. you can then also wander over there. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.